If the scope of my project is wrong, will the project be wrong? Uh, just an introduction to PSI Project Management. Uh, PSI Project Management, we've been around now since 2002, and we focus on project management training currently. We have two levels of scope. We have project product scope. The product scope is the requirements, the features, and attributes of the product, the service, or the result that is needed for acceptance. What am I going to accept? What is my product going to include? Then we have the project scope. It's, it's broader. The project scope is the product scope plus uh, any additional requirements that are needed to successfully complete the project. So it takes on a broader uh, uh, sense than the product scope itself. Now, scope means different things to different people methodologies, different methods of managing projects. For example, in a predictive project, we have identified the scope up front and uh, we are uh, then going to execute that scope to the project. We might do this by using what we call progressive elaboration, meaning as we learn more about the project, then we will actually uh, update the plan and we will update the uh, documents to reflect that new knowledge. So predictive project management, all the requirements are identified up front. Now, I'm not going to say all, but the biggest part of the requirements will be identified up front, such as if you are building a building, you're going to have drawings, you're going to have a, a detailed plan on how to build that building. Iterative, we develop it over time. Progressive elaboration, we learn more over time. Iterative is we're actually iterating the development of whatever our deliverable is until we get to the final output, which would be the deliverable itself. Incremental kind of falls into the same category. And agile is where we really don't know the full scope of the project, we have a story, we have a vision, but we don't know the actual scope. It's not documented, it's not planned. And uh, you know, it, it's kind of a, we develop it as we go along type of a process. And generally agile is going to be using both iterative and incremental approaches with it. So let's talk about that a little bit further. In a traditional project, uh, uh, we look at it and we have what's called the iron triangle or the triple constraint. Now this is traditional. This is a predictive type project. So first of all, we have a scope that is fixed. We have a fixed scope right at the bottom of that. You can see that the scope is fixed. Well, uh, when that scope is fixed, if we make a change to it, uh, then uh, we're actually going to probably change the schedule and we're probably going to change the cost. So the iron triangle or triple constraint says, if I make a change to one leg of this triangle, I will change at least one of the others, if not both of the other legs. Now compare that to agile right here. Now, in Agile, the scope is developed iteratively. We don't have a plan. We don't have a scope baseline. We don't have a scope statement. Okay? Everything in Agile is based on the story, the vision of the deliverable, and the stories that uh, demonstrate to us what the stakeholders want to include in that project. So the schedule might be fixed. I may have a, uh, do an iteration that's time boxed. And that iteration says I have one to four weeks generally, sometimes eight weeks, depends on what you're doing and depends on the method you're using. But it has a date tied to it. I will release that iteration on the date that's specified. So it's a fixed date. To do that, I may have to decrease the amount of scope that I'm going to deliver. 
So schedule is fixed. The cost is also fixed. I may be have an authorized uh, authorized budget that I can spend ten thousand dollars a month on this project. When I reach that ten thousand dollar limit, then I'm done with this project for the month. The next month, I'll pick up on it and do some more work on it. That's a good comparison then between the traditional approach and the agile approach with regards to scope. So let's talk about agile first of all. In Agile, I have what's called the product vision. And the product vision or the vision statement provides the business need. I also have what we call a user story. That describes what the user, the customer, wants us to deliver. There might be many user stories affiliated with a, uh, a project, an iteration even. An iteration is a period of time that we're going to be working on what we call the backlog. The backlog is the prioritized list of tasks that are to be completed. So in a uh, uh, iteration, we will deliver a backlog which has all those tasks assigned to it. So in those tasks, what we do, we prioritize them. It's a prioritized list of of, of tasks to be completed. The priority is based on what will deliver value to the customer the soonest. Then we have a release plan. A release plan is going to tell us when we will be releasing the various iterations, i.e. the various levels of uh, scope that we're developing. And then we have what's called the burn down chart that reports the work that remains to be done, a burn-up chart reports the work that has been completed. And then at the end of each iteration, we're going to do what's called retrospective. In a traditional project, we call it lessons learned. But in an agile project, we call it a retrospective. So what we do at the end of that iteration is we sit down as a team and we discuss that iteration, how it went, and what we want to improve and we may come up with two or three things that we want to improve, and we would include those items into the next iteration so that we can have continuous improvement in our product and in the processes that we're using. So let's look at these real quick. A product vision, for example. So the product vision, you can see right here, it describes for us who we're developing this product for, what needs it's responding to. It responds to those needs by providing the following. And then the customer will buy this product because. That is the product vision statement. That's what's going to guide us in the development of our project itself. Then we have what we call a backlog. So this is the pro product backlog. Now the product backlog encapsulates all of the other iterations and other, all the other backlogs that you might do on a project. So you can see here I have listed the various descriptions of what I'm going to be delivering. I have prioritized them on a priority of one to eight. And then I have a story that relates what that is satisfying, what story that is satisfying. The first thing I would deliver, the highest priority, would be the layout and design of the patio. That would give the most deliverable to uh, uh, the customer the earliest. And that's, a, that's a, a tenant of agile projects. Get the value in the hands of the customer as quickly as possible. The next thing we have then Agile release plan. A sprint is the same thing as an iteration. So you can see this project, I have four different sprints or iterations. Now I describe here what I'm going to release in iteration one, two, three, and four. What I'll be releasing to the customer. Now there's no definite timeline associated with this. 
Agile is very uh, much uh, uh, done in a, a, a collaborative, iter iterative type of a, arrangement. And, and so this would be the release plan. But I lay it out so I know when each iteration, each backlog, each one of these represents a backlog, will be delivered to the customer. So I know the order in which I'll be delivering them. So that's the release plan. We then do the retrospective. A retrospective is looking backward at what we did in that iteration and what we want to keep, what we want to do more of, and what we want to do less of. And so you can see I listed three different sprints here, gave a description of the sprints, and then I notified or identified the areas I wanted to keep that worked well and uh, area that I wanted to improve in, I want more of. There were no areas that I wanted less of. So that would be your retrospective. Then you have the agile form that I made up. So the product vision, for example, we talked about that. So here is the product vision here. And, and you remember that followed this same line. We are developing this product for, to respond to the following need and how it responds to those needs. And the customer will buy this product because. And then here is a classic example of a product vision. We are developing this product for our bank customers so they will be able to view their online account status during the online, using the online banking application which will provide them anytime access to their account and allow them to access features, banking features online. This application will allow 24 hour banking service as compared to eight o'clock AM, eight o'clock PM service allowed by most comparable banks. That is the product vision. You notice that there's no technical specifications in this. It's a story. It's what I want as a customer. We go on to the Epic story, and uh, this is the vision, whereas the Epic story uh, gives you, uh, really is starting to develop for you what you're gonna be working on. It's breaking it down to a lower level. So it represents a series of user stories that share a broader strategic objectives. So an Epic will typically require development work covering several different sprints or iterations. It won't be one, but it will be several. So now here's an example. As a bank customer, I want to view my statement balance online anytime I want to see my account balance, transfer money, and pay bills. So I want to visually see it. That's what I'm saying here. I want to be able to see it on, online and I also want to see my account balance. I want to transfer money and I want to pay bills. So this is giving me work items that I will have to complete to complete this epic story. But again, you do not see any technical data present. Then we have the user story. And these are simple sentence structures, such as, as a persona, who we are building, who we are building this for, and what I want, and the reason I want it, or what it solves. As the account owner, I want to display overview of account once logged in. I want to see my account, period. As the account owner, I want to see the total funds available, all accounts basically, so I can understand my financial position. As the account owner, I want to view individual account balances. So in other words, I want a total account balance, then I want to be able to look at my individual account balances. As the account owner, I want to transfer money between accounts. And as the account owner, I want to be able to automatically transfer periodically. So not have to do it manually, but it happened periodically. And as the account owner, I want to pay bills directly from the account. So now I have described all these stories. Now, if you were a software developer, you would come and you would take this first story in the backlog. Let's look at the backlog. 
Those stories translate into the backlog right here. So as a software developer, first thing I'm going to do on this project is I'm going to pick up item number one, priority number one, and I'm going to start working on it. I'm starting developing the software around this uh, backlog. Somebody else in the team would pick up on number two. Somebody else in the team could pick up on number three and so forth. Or I may have a couple people working on the same backlog item. It just depends on what you're doing. But the important part of this is I have identified everything I want to be included in this project. And now I will start executing that as a team member based on the priority within the backlog. So that's the key item here. So this is the agile approach to scope. And as you can see, I can add more scope requirements in anytime I want to. In Agile, I embrace changes. Change is the norm. The customer is there working with me. The customer is helping me. The customer is deeply involved with this. They actually might be a part of the team itself. So that's the Agile approach. Now we look at one other slide here, and this kind of summarizes Agile. This is called a scrum flow chart. So first of all, we have our product vision. Then we have our product backlog and it's prioritized. We do our vision meeting. Then we have a release schedule. That would be our release plan. Now we have coming out of that release plan, different sprints, different iterations. Okay. And a sprint, in Scrum is one to six weeks long. Uh, you can say generally it's going to be one to eight weeks long, typically. That's typical range of a sprint or an iteration. Scrum is a little bit different. So I will start executing these actual iterations or sprints. Now, once I have delivered a sprint, I've done it, completed it. The customer will accept those deliverables. We'll have that sprint review meeting. And then once we have, the customer has accepted those deliverables, we will sit down and do our retrospective and come up with improvements. Those improvements would flow right back into another backlog and we would continue on. And that's a, a cycle that would be continued. So sounds a lot like progressive elaboration and, and really progressive elaboration, which we call it in a traditional environment, is really an agile type of an approach to a predictive project. So now in a traditional or predictive project, we have our 10 by five by 49, our project management structure. Now we're gonna to focus today on project scope management. And we have several processes we'll talk about. Plan scope management, collect requirements, define scope, create WBS, uh, validate scope, and then control scope. So that is our focus today, those processes. Now in a traditional type of a project, this is a good uh, explanation of how we do those projects. So first of all, we have a sponsor, that's the person paying for the project. We have business documents such as a business case that will establish the need for the project. Then we'll do our initiating processes. Then we will start planning. Once we have enough planning done that we can start executing, we will start executing the project. We'll plan, we'll execute. As we are planning and executing, we will monitor and control that project, the planned results, the actual results to the planned results to make sure we're staying on track with the plan. If we have a variance, then we will be required to issue a change request to correct that variance. Then once that project is uh, finished, then we will close it out and we will transfer that deliverable to the end user 
and then we will file all the documentation away. So that's the way we do a traditional project. And scope is going to be a big part of it, and that's what we're going to talk about coming up here next. So now there's another approach to that 10 by 5 by 49. And I want you to look at that. That's pretty important. Uh, we have this practical flow, practical project management flow. And this is, comes from the practical project management course, which I teach uh, also. All right, so we start off with plan the scope management right here. Then we collect the requirements. Then we build on that and we define the scope. We write the scope statement. Once we have that scope statement written, then we decompose that scope statement down into the WBS and we create the scope baseline. And that's what will guide us in the development of the scope throughout the rest of the project. Now, I want you to look at this before we move on because this is important. And this answers the question basically uh, of if you get the scope wrong, will the project be wrong? So we have the scope baseline as an output of create WBS. That flows into the schedule area. First thing we do is we decompose that scope down into the activities. We sequence activities, estimate activity durations, and we develop our scope, our schedule baseline. So that's based on the scope. We estimate cost, determine budget. The budget. Uh, this gives us right here our cost baseline. So it's built based on the scope. So now we come over, we plan procurement. Procurement is going to be based on the scope. Qualitative risk analysis and all. Risk analysis, that's going to be based on the scope. We're going to execute the work based on the scope. We're going to monitor it. We're going to perform integrated change for all of these things. Everything in the project is based on the scope. So I can safely say if we get the scope wrong, our project is going to be wrong. So the first step is to plan scope management. This gives us our scope management plan and our scope management plan is going to tell us how to manage the scope how to do the other processes of scope, such as how do I do the collect requirements process? How do I uh, validate scope? How do I create WBS? How do I do those other processes? That's what it's going to tell us. We also have as an output, the requirements management plan. Now this is going to be focused on collecting requirements, prioritizing requirements, justifying requirements, and things of this nature. So you can see the process itself, plan scope management. We have inputs into this process that enable us through use of the tools and techniques to create the outputs. And here are my outputs, scope management plan and requirements management plan. Here's what a scope management plan would look like. Now, uh, this is the scope management plan here. And this is, has a, a lot of good valuable information in it for us to use in our project. So the work breakdown structure description. What is our WBS going to look like? We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we describe that. The dic WBS dictionary, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But look at this. How do I do the other processes such as collect requirements, define scope, create WBS, validate scope, and so forth. The project work will be accepted during the following phases. So this is the deliverable acceptance criteria. If you attended the uh, Developed Project Management Charter Seminar, you would understand that one of the things in that project charter is acceptance criteria for the project. Now we have more acceptance criteria here. What says this project is done? And in this case, it's going to be accepted during different stages. And then we have other specific information that uh, 
you know, might be pertinent to the development of the scope itself. So that is our scope management plan. Next would be our requirements management plan. These are actually documents that I use in the practical project management course. So this is the requirements management plan. How will requirements be collected? And so you describe right here how those requirements will be collected. Then how will requirements be analyzed? Are they going to be analyzed to determine if they're required? Uh, are they going to be justified? Exactly how are the requirements going to be analyzed? We describe that process. We have the categories of requirements. In a project, categories are extremely important to us as we're going through the planning stages and even executing stages. Because we have those categories, we can align similar items, okay, together. For example, to sequence them or to analyze them uh, to understand the dependencies for any number of reasons. So we always want to have good solid list of categories that we're going to apply to our requirements. And then how are we going to format the requirement? In this case, we have a requirements document, so I simply referred to that. Specify requirement prioritization methodology. So requirements will be prioritized based on the project need, client need, overall project requirements, fit, and cost, and desirability. Then define the requirements traceability methodology. You see, we need to track requirements back to the owner, and this gives us that ability. Page two, define requirements reporting methods. Determine how requirements will be validated. Okay, acceptance criteria, basically. Define how configuration will be managed. We may have some uh, changes to them. Uh, we want to make sure we're able to manage that configuration. And then remarks and general information. So that is the requirements management plan. Now, you can understand the importance of the the scope management plan and the requirements management plan, but they don't contain details about the project. We need to understand the fundamental requirements for this project, so we need to dig deeper. All right, so now we're starting to get the basic requirements for the project. Now, who do these requirements come from? Stakeholders. We had a seminar on stakeholders. Actually, we have one coming up. But uh, collect requirements from the stakeholders. So that would give us then the requirements documentation. Right here. Requirements documentation. So now the requirements documentation will give us the key requirements for this project. And the rest of the project will be built using these requirements. We're going to document them. We're going to manage stakeholder needs and expectations. And we want to understand what those are. So once again, you see we have some inputs, key inputs, that give us the information needed to work on it, to come up with the tools and techniques, and then ultimately create the outputs, which are the requirements documentation and the requirements traceability matrix. So what do they look like? So we have two documents here that PMI recommends, but Roy says tie the two documents together into one uh, and then save yourself some steps and some paperwork. So that's the requirements documentation, the format. So let's look at it. Now you can see here, I've listed the requirement, the stakeholder who has that requirement, the category, the priority, the acceptance criteria. I want to know what says this requirement has been accepted, we've met the need, how we're going to verify it or test it, when it will be released, 
What business objective is satisfied? And what is the status? Is it working? Is it done? Exactly what is the status? So you can see this is not rocket science. It's not. It's a matter of getting into the nitty gritty of your project. And this is foundational to the scope of the project, understanding what the requirements are. Once you have identified the requirements, then you're going to take this process called define scope. And this is where you create the scope statement. Now the scope statement is going to be written by the project manager and the team. And you're going to sit down and you're going to take those requirements and the requirements documentation, and you're going to rewrite them into this scope statement. It's a comprehensive text document that talks about the project scope and the product scope in detail. It's detailed. So those, that project scope statement is our understanding of what this project is all about. So it's a very, very important document. And we're going to use this scope statement then to decompose it down into our work breakdown structure. So you can see, we start off with a project charter. We collect requirements. Well, we identify stakeholders. We collect requirements. Then we develop a comprehensive document called scope statement. Then we decompose that down into the work breakdown structure. So here is the process. And you can see right here that key to this is the requirements documentation as an input. And we're going to establish a lot of different things based on the analysis that we do with the tools and techniques. And we have a project scope statement as the output. Progressive elaboration says, as I learn more about the project, I'm going to update to reflect what I've learned. In this case, you can see that we have learned a lot about our project and we are going to actually update the project documents and even the project plans if needed at this point. So updates is a output of a number of processes, updates to reflect that new knowledge. So here is our project scope statement. Now this could be a page long. It could be a hundred page long. I mean, it just depends on the size of your project. In this case, I've got everything listed on one page. And what I've come up with here is basically my project scope that's project, detailed description. I have my project deliverable, a detailed description. I have my product acceptance criteria. I have my project exclusions. On some projects, this could be critical. It could be critical. Now, why do I say that? Take, uh, uh, if you were building a house on a five acre plot of land and it was all wooded and you were not going to landscape all five acres, you're going to landscape one acre, it would be appropriate to note it to say, hey, this only includes landscaping one acre or half acre, whatever it might be. And that way there's no question about what your deliverable would be. Then you have constraints. I have to have this project done by uh, June the 1st, 2022. Uh, I cannot spend more than $100,000 on this project. Those would be constraints. Generally, those constraints would come directly from the project charter. Project charter should list those constraints as requirements for the project completions. We have project assumptions. Assumptions are things that we believe to be true. And then project risk. Risk are potential uh, uncertainties that might happen to this project. And I want to identify risk as I go through developing my project scope statement. So this can get very lengthy, very lengthy. And uh, it just depends on the size of the project itself. 
but it should be very comprehensive because what you're going to do with this is you're then going to break it down into the scope baseline. The scope baseline is an output of create WBS process. We take that WBS, uh, the scope statement, we decompose it, and that gives us the WBS and WBS dictionary. Now, the scope baseline itself is made up of the WBS, the scope statement, and the WBS dictionary. So here we have our inputs, create WBS. Notice that I have the project scope statement as a input. I also have the requirements documentation as an input. It would be a reference document for me to use. And I will decompose that scope statement down into the scope baseline. And that scope baseline includes the WBS, WBS dictionary and the scope state. Now a WBS is a graphical hierarchical chart for the most part. You can use many things to create. You can use Excel a workbook or you can use mind mapping software. You can use an organizational type chart software. And there are actually some software packages out there specific for the WBS but it has basically five items in it. And most of the time, most people only use two items. And that is the title. It's got to have a title and it's got to have an index number. It could have the durations. It could have the cost for each work package and a control account number where you would assign your cost to. But other than that, that's all the information that's in a WBS. Here is a WBS, a WBS. This is for an office complex. And you can see right here, I have my index number. Here I have the uh, duration in days. Here I have the cost for this work package. And up here I have a control account number. Not much information. Now, when I'm estimating, doing bottom-up estimating, for example, uh, I start estimating at this level, each work package, and I aggregate that up into the branch, and then I'll aggregate all the branches up into the project to come up with my total duration of my project and my total cost for the project. That's called bottom-up estimating. Now, the WBS Dictionary. This contains the details necessary to execute the work package. This is key. As a project manager, you will execute the work packages. The work packages are always related to the deliverable, and that's the level at which you as a project manager will work from, and that is to make sure that each work package is being executed. So these are some of the items that will be in the WBS Dictionary. We'll look at that real quick. So here's the WBS Dictionary. And you can see it has space, at least, for a lot of different details. Now, these are forms that, obviously, I developed. You know, when you develop your own forms, of course, they may look entirely different than this, and that's fine. They may include some of the things, uh, for example, that you see here, but maybe you have additional items, maybe you have fewer items. But when you look at this, I want you to see that uh, this has a lot of information on that work package. And it describes for us in detail exactly what we're going to do in that work package. For example, the name of it, assumptions and constraints, description of the work to be done, detailed description, milestones, if I have milestones associated with this work package, activities associated with this work package, and then uh, resources that are needed right here to do the, act, the work packages and the activities. And then quality requirements is a factor. Acceptance criteria is a factor. Technical information if needed. And then if you're going to outsource parts of it, uh, the agreement information would also be a part of it. So you can see there's a lot of detail here. And as a project manager, 
uh, as a team member, you're going to execute work packages. Work packages are described as being small enough that it can be managed. It's small enough it can be estimated for cost and time, and it's small enough that it can be completed by a person or a group of people. That's the definition of a work package. So our scope baseline is unique to each project. It is composed of the scope statement, the WBS, and the WBS dictionary. To change this baseline in a traditional project requires a change request, an approved change request. Once that scope uh, baseline is output, it is a controlled document, a controlled plan. And to make a change to it, you have to have approved change request. If you have an approved change request, then you can update the baseline and proceed on with the project. Now, here's what happens. If you gold plate or you add more to the scope than was required. When you get to the end of the project, you did not complete the project uh, successfully. You added more to the project than what was required. You changed the scope to the project. But now if you issue a change, an approved change request, and you modify the baseline to reflect that change, you get to the end of the project. When you look back, you finish the project on scope, within scope. So those approved change requests are the only thing that can change the scope baseline. So let's look at the original question. If the scope of my project is wrong, will the project be wrong? The answer is yes, most definitely. If you do not do enough scope development, or you get it wrong, then the project will be wrong. Everything in the project is based on the scope. So when you're doing the scope of the project, you gotta get it right. 